Welcome back to another episode of Jamin's Daily. Today we're going to do another movie review of a 1980s horror film titled Life Force. And our guest, the one and only Seth Kaler, is going to lead the way. Seth, why don't you tell us a little bit about this movie? All right. All right. Yes. And I'm, and I'm happy to do another movie. These are so much fun. Let's see. So Life Force. It's a 1985 science fiction horror film directed by Toby Hooper. Toby Hooper is big in the horror uh, industry. He did uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, did some big ones. So, all right, so Toby Hooper, written and directed by Dan O'Brien, Don Jacoby, starring Steve Railsback, Peter Firth, Frank Finley, Matilda May, and Patrick Stewart, Mr. Star Trek himself. Okay. It's based on a novel from 1976 uh, called The Space Vampires. Ooh. Yes, uh, it portrays the events that unfold after a trio of humanoids in a state of suspended animation are brought to the Earth after being discovered in the hold of an alien spaceship by the crew of a European spaceship. Yes, so let me get let's get into this from Jamin's memory. <sighs> I watched this movie probably from about the hours of 10 and 12 right. on a Friday night. Man, party. Maybe it was Saturday night. <laughs> it may have been Saturday. Mm. But I just picked it off of a thumbnail on HBO Max. I said, let's watch this. Mm -hmm. And it just started off with some kind of a multinational space program. Mm -hmm. And they were... Trying, they're gonna do an investigation or some kind of research on Haley's Comet, right? Haley's Comet. Haley's Comet. Yes. And as they're approaching the comet, this is when they come across an alien spaceship that is just floating in tow, in. In tow you know, oh, it's with it. cruising along with it's it. It's cruising along oh, wow, with okay. it. All right. So it's this large mothership. Yeah. And so they pull up to it, and there's this. So let's think of all the cheesy 1980s. Space, special effects, special effects and filming that right. you can imagine. Okay. Okay. They then they show them again eighties effects disembark. So they're doing a space walk. Uh. So they 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 you're led to believe maybe that they're in some kind of like jet thrusters, jet pack gotcha. kind of like spacesuit with gotcha. jet packs. So they're kind of like floating. It's like two, how many people? Four or five people. I think there's about there? four. Okay. Yes, about four. That sounds right. Mm. About a team of four. And the main, uh, what's the main character? Because he's the guy who's in it at the end, in the whole movie. He he's the an American astronaut right. in the movie. Um. So well, we've got a lot of colonel. Is this this must be some sort of um, military mission? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah he's a colonel because there there's uh, Colonel Tom Carlson, Colonel Colin Kane, Doctor Hans Falada, and Doctor Armstrong, Doctor Leonard. So there's lots of doctors and colonels. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably those people. Yes. Yeah. Tom, Colin, Hans, Leonard. Tom is the main astronaut. So gotcha. Steve rails back. When they get there, mm. they get into the to the alien spaceship. It's actually very thrilling. I can imagine being in the movie theater in 1985 and thinking this is pretty cool. Yeah. Right. So they use there's a lot of um, if you've seen movies like did Alien come come on come before this or after this? Aliens was before eighty five, right? I, yeah, I think so. I'd, yeah, I have to look it up. But I can do that by the power of the internet. Go ahead, right? Keep, but, keep going. but there's some really cool background where you're led to see like yeah. the immenseness of the spaceship and them coming in. Sure. And when they get in there, y you see this very. Um, it's almost like. Um, statue but almost more of like a cocoon like almost like a, a clay statue or something mm. that's been you know like when vampires here's the thing you know when yeah. vampires see the sun and yeah. they sh they turn uh, into yes. some kind of right. thing like, yes. okay you see these creatures with winged winged creature kinds of like vampires or this sorts. is inside their spaceship this inside the spaceship okay. all right and they just kind of go past it, but mm. it, it's a big part of the movie. Like, oh, yeah, right. and yeah. so think about this later on when they talk about vampires, ah, right? Okay. Part of the vampires yeah. theme. They go further into the spaceship. This is where they find when you're reading the the you know the summary, right? Humanoids, humans, yes, as it looks, three, it says. in this glass, and there's two males and one female in this glass coffin. Right, is really the best way to mention sure. it. A glass coffin. 
Well, you don't see until later. There's flashbacks within the movie later mm. where it shows them literally put them in tow and take them over and this yeah. and that. But um, long story short, the lady, when they arrive back on Earth, uh-huh. no, no, this is what happens. A, um, a rescue mission is what happens. So other people go... You know, another spaceship goes and saves them. They come back to Earth Mm -hmm. with the humanoids. And he, Colonel, um, what is his name? Colin, Colonel Tom. Colonel Tom Mm -hmm. is the only survivor. Oh. Okay, he's the only survivor when they get back with these humanoids. I got you. And later in the movie, he's telling the story. Because when he gets back, he's all PSP, you know, he's all PTSD. Uh He's in a loony, he's in a hospital Uh because he's barely coming to. Mm. They're asking him, you know, what happened here and there. Right. And. So does the majority of this movie happen on Earth? And like it's just the beginning part and with some flashbacks of space? Yes. I got you. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe the first 15 minutes they're in space, but then the majority they're back on Earth. Right. And it's all like debriefing. Like, who is this lady? What happened? Why did all these people get killed? Uh And a large part of it, you find out, is because he's being like mind controlled by this humanoid Uh who later on you find out are like extra extra terrestrial type vampires in the life sources that's how they life force life life force is how they they kill <clears throat> people you know uh, instead of, you know like a vampire yes, sucks your blood they take your life they take your life force, life force. so yeah. there's this special effects where whenever they kiss their mm. it's you know this yeah. lightning this yeah. like your soul leader. and they yeah. suck them out and at one point I don't. Ex- I don't exactly remember how the female. Maybe it's on there. You can look it up. How the humanoid gets out of her glass. The female alien awakens and drains the life force out of a guard, and yes. then she escapes the facility and proceeds uh, to drain. Out of yeah, and this whole time, as she's escaping and walking about, she's naked, fully. Wow. Right. And they're in London too, by the way, because that's. Uh, anyways. In London, yeah. it must have been cheaper to film there somehow. Yeah, it was a British movie. I mean, I think it was a. Oh really? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't know if London plays into it at all, but I just no, wow, there I is. See you know, I the I think it does play into a lot because the Colonel is the way they play it off is that yeah, he's a foreign. You know, he's being he's being prodded and asked all these things of by the British government. Uh-huh. So there's this one guy who's in the movie who's the British intelligence uh-huh. talking to this U.S astronaut gotcha. who has all the intel hey you're the only survivor of this mm. mission and now we have these humanoids who are killing people right they're not human and they've escaped and at this time that guy tom is having these dreams and flashbacks and one of them is what he's like obsessing over the female I'm looking at her, mm. and they. Ki- he then in turn says that she like she she made him sabotage the the mm. mission and kill the other people. Well, I think also too it says here that just like vampires, like if you get bitten, then you become a vampire. Mm. Or something. So these when she wakes up and kills these guards, the guards come, they revive, and now they have the ability to drain life forces too. Do you, he, remember, do you remember? That? No, I don't remember any of that. You know, I remember when she sucks the life out of them, they get real old. And here was the deal: they have to do it very quickly. Soon after, or not, they drain away again. They shrivel. Yeah. They shrink into right. non-existence. Yeah. Because the one, I think, the one that she bit, who she didn't suck all the life force out of, uh-huh. and turns him into a vampire. Uh-huh. Yeah. He ends up falling you know shriveling away Uh because he hasn't had any life Uh, force gotcha okay and that's part of the scene they're all looking at because they're in this like military deal so he's locked up and they're watching him movie ends is you know is this movie i can see why it was a um of 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 it was what do you call it a movie it was a flop a flop and it was uh a monetarily monetarily it had a budget of 25 million dollars mm-hmm. 
and it made 11 back so half it, and i think this guy what happened was investors made a big play on this director because he had already been doing Te some yeah, things he did them in texas chainsaw. right so it will check texas chainsaw I'm like, oh let's give him this huge buzz huge budget we're gonna make you know all kinds of money right and i, I can understand because the movie is very slow okay it, it, it's slow there's not a lot of um action in the movie there's not a lot of uh -huh. um suspense really everything is kind of, there's a little bit of it i guess but it doesn't it's just a mediocre movie where if you were putting a lot of money into it that's what i was saying like i don't couldn't even imagine where they spent the 25 million <laughs> because special effects some yeah. of those other movies that we've watched yeah uh that were shot for much less uh -huh. it, it seems on par it was like they paid for the talent and they paid for these high directors that's all into the budget mm. And then, like the marketing, yeah. I bet you they just mark. They probably spent, yeah, fifteen million dollars on marketing all over the country, and then people just didn't like it. Yeah, uh, probably. Um, so she gets up, the space girl, as they call her, and goes around uh, killing some guards and doing some things or whatever. But it says, meanwhile, in Texas, an escape pod is found uh, from Churchill, and this guy Carlson's inside of it, though. He's the main guy that was remembering all these things. Yes. So they course. find him in Texas, which is funny. So there we go. See, there's always a Texas connection because Texas is the best. Because when you say Texas, people know where you're talking about. <laughs> they don't say Ohio because right. people in, yeah. Brit in yeah. the UK be like, where yeah. the heck is Ohio? I know. Yeah. Well, when you say Texas, Iowa. Yeah. I don't know if there's Iowan, Iowanian listeners. I'm sorry, but listen, we love nothing you. wrong with Ohio. Yes. Ohio. <laughs> We're all <laughs> United States, okay? But um, yeah. Texas is but they have to up. hypnotize this guy to, to, for him to remember stuff, though. Like you said, he's messed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when when they when they rescue him, yeah, that's when they do all the debriefing. And again, he's he's debriefing with uh, with British intel, British people. I don't mm. understand why that's the case. If he got rescued there in Texas, right? Mm. But they're all part of this multinational. It's not really even the British. I don't think. Yeah. But it becomes a British issue because the humanoids are now there in mm. the uk right so that's where he where this carlson guy i think maybe tom is the other the british um gotcha investigator yeah of sorts because a large part of the movie is the u.s astronaut who is probably carlson mm. the uk lieutenant general investigator guy right. then there's the secretary of home Mm. So I guess like maybe the Secretary of Defense sure. is right. the, he's in it, mm -hmm. and they're they're all they're they're with each other half the time. Everywhere they're going, they're going together, trying to solve what's going on. Yeah, and they declare martial law in London because the uh, vampire plague is sweeping through the city. Yes, and later on, as they're going further onto it, there's more and more of them are all uh, like vampires. Yeah. Right? it's a huge problem. Very very. Um, you know, kind of ahead of its time in that regard, kind of where you see all these different um, zombie movies nowadays where, you know, what's the word? The one that World War Z or yeah, World War right. Z kind of thing. Where people get bit kind of zombie movies. Yeah. So, he, Carlson, this whole time, again, he has this meta metaphysical connection uh -huh. to the space girl. Ah. Okay. Yeah. He's thinking about her. He's, she's drawing him in somehow. He starts to profess that she chose him because mm. he's the only survivor. Mm -hmm. So she chose him to do whatever it was that he did. And now she's free. And there's this scene where <laughs> they're like in a chapel or something. Uh-huh. And as he's approaching her, her true form is kind of like in the back, like flashing. Mm. It, and it's the ugly, extraterrestrial, bat-looking thing. Uh, okay? Okay. But it's like, they it's taking this humanoid form. Mm -hmm. Okay? Maybe because they want to eat all the humans or something. I don't know. There, there's not a lot of uh, backstory to that. It sounds like this is kind of a lackluster movie no it know? didn't really fall into the line like it didn't make sense how their vampire like i, I could see the vampire play and how right. they're sucking the life force out yeah and you know the the, the acting is not terrible yeah and they obviously spent some money on the actors they spent yes. some money on the special effects 
But maybe the storyline just a little whack out. Or it, it just it, it wasn't. I guess it wasn't gripping. You know, it was just an average, average movie. So I can see yeah. in the 1985 when you went and saw this movie, and then you went and told it, your buddies asked you, uh, you know, how was life? Life Force was it yeah. good? Eh, it was all right. Hey, I think that's what. Space, most space Girl is a good looking even now uh, in 2002 there Matilda May is her name she's Matilda uh, May attractive 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 space I'm girl I'm telling you she yeah. was was probably the most talented actress thespian uh-huh. in this movie it's one of the reasons why it's probably a cult classic she does some great acting throughout I don't think she says a word oh. but just really um she has a presence in the movie, folks. You'll see what I'm talking about. Watch it. And this is what we're going to do, Seth. Folks, uh-huh. I hope yeah. on, on this segment, because Life life Force, we, we went through pretty quickly. It was a terrible movie. So, yeah. you know, sometimes uh-huh. we're going to come across this where I sure. watch the whole movie, I dedicate the time, and right. we got to kind of talk about it because I could just lose uh-huh. an hour and a half, right? right? But then we're going to move on to another one. So this is going to be a two for one. Perfect. Let's do that. But I got a little bit of trivia for this one now too. Love let's it. Let's throw it in at the end because yeah, it wasn't too great. That's because what, we're what, what I wanted to say too, if you know that it, you said it just kind of dragged on or whatever. Well, Toby Hooper, the director, and you know they give them this big. But he actually did a director's cut of it, and it was two hours and eight minutes long. Wow, it was and longer. So yeah, and then they cut it down to one hour and fifty six minutes. Um, but yeah, so it could have been way longer, right? Um. Matilda May, um, the space girl, she only has seven minutes of screen time. Really? Like, all together. It's only seven minutes that uh, that she has. And, mo- and, most, and of most of it is, she like, plays she's... It totally nude, she plays totally nude. Yeah, she totally... Every time, it's like her walking, kind of, uh-huh. or her moving, her here, her there, so... Yeah. The uh, the other male vampires, or whatever, there was a, uh, censorship rules back then that forbade full male nudity, so mm. that's why she was naked and they mm. weren't, so well, good for us, I guess. Yes, that they, was, that's a good rule. They filmed wearing flesh-colored socks over their genitals. Mm, I didn't notice. <laughs> I was looking at their faces. Yes, exactly. My eyes are up here. Mm. Um, Toby Hooper uh, almost lost one of his ears during the shooting scene. Uh, it was freezing cold, and they were outside in the English Moors... And uh, his ear almost froze off. Wow. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, let's see. Maybe one last <coughs> thing here. <laughs> That's how we roll right here. Hold on. Fucking kill the <laughs> bug. Just put that piece out. <laughs> um, Is there there's no sequel? No, no, no sequel. No yeah, sequel, no. lost a lot of money. But Sir Patrick Stewart, right? Oh, yes. Probably one of the biggest names in this show. Had his very first on-screen kiss in this movie, and it was with oh. Steve Railsback. You know, let's talk about two, so two guys, Sir Patrick. Mm-hmm. In this movie, he's like a mental case, some kind of psychologist or, or something, uh-huh. and he's brought in to help with Carlson because again, I already told you he has like PTSD. He's losing his mind, uh-huh. and somehow that's when you know, yeah. Ben, what, what, what's yeah. his name? Ben what? Kingsley? What's, what's yeah, his name? Patrick Stewart. Sir, pa- Patrick Stewart. <laughs> yes, Patrick, yes, Stewart. Yes, yes. Patrick Stewart. Yeah, Patrick Stewart uh, is in the movie. Yeah. Uh, Professor X. That's how That's I That's right. Him. Yes. One last little piece of tidbit before we move on. I just wanted to say this real quick. So, you were talking about how they suck the life force out, right? Mm-hmm. And they, they get sh- kind of shriveled up, it says, right? That's right. Well, they use these dummies for the shriveled up people that were dead or whatever. Mm-hmm. They got reused in the 1999 movie The Mummy. They found them in some back, back, uh, you know, lot on the on the film set, and said these would make great mummies. Wow, so, you know, th- you I'm go. thinking. I, I think I remember the specific movie scene where they probably <laughs> used that same yeah. prop. That's so, crazy. There you go. Well, good. You know, folks, I watched that movie. I think maybe either last Friday or Saturday. At the time, it was a pretty decent movie, but I'm gonna give it. Maybe I want to start scoring some of these uh, movies, Seth. Out of okay. out of ten stars, I guess yeah. ten being the best. Okay. This was like <laughs> I'm gonna give it like a sixty-two or something like that. Because <laughs> it didn't, f- it, it failed, but not. You're giving it a, a, a sixty-two, hope. but the highest on the scale is ten. Oh, uh, 
Uh, I mean, 6.2. Okay. 6.2. He's going to get a 6.2. Okay, 6.2. 6.2. Yeah. 6.2. Right. There you go. Okay. Yeah, but I can know. tell. I can tell by your uh, memory <coughs> of this movie or whatever that it just wasn't. Uh, didn't catch the. Yeah, it didn't. Thing. Yeah, that's good, and that's fine because some some of these probably aren't worth watching. So they're, they're forgettable. Okay. Many of them are probably forgettable. But the next one was I actually started watching this movie before Life Force. Okay. I started watching this one maybe a day before or earlier in the day. All right. This one's also a cult classic, I think. Mm-hmm. I remember this because this movie because I, I remembered the the VHX the VHS box yes. cover right. that used to be at like Blockbuster right. or Hollywood Video or something like that. Right. This one was called Hell Razor. Oh uh, yeah. And it's this where the pin needle the yes. these pins or nails the nails yeah on his face. And so I 1987 it. film too. So we, we we progressed a little bit. Yeah, Last and they've one made was 85. They made a bunch of these. Yeah, look it up. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, how yeah, many yeah. have they Absolutely. made? Absolutely. Um, boy, uh, let's let's find out here. Move the mic. The mic covering all your whole face there. Good. Sorry. You yes, I, down, but it, it just down. sounds so much better, Jamie. Oh, no. So, um, but Hellraiser is a 1987 a British supernatural horror film written and directed by Clive Barker. Clive Barker's big, yes, um, in the horror uh, world and produced by Christopher Figg. Not that we know who he is. It's based on uh, Clive Barker's novella called uh, The Hellbound Heart. Mm. The film marked Barker's directorial debut. So oh. Clive Barker, this is his very beginning. Film involves a puzzle box which summons the Cenobites, a murderous group from another dimension who cannot differentiate between pain and pleasure. They are led by the lead Cenobite, played by Doug Brady, and he is identified in the sequels as Pinhead. Pinhead. And there's several. It's Pinhead, and he's got like three different, um, th- three different, there's a motley crew of like three others, and they're all equally grotesque, strange looking, uh-huh. right? And in the movie, it starts off. In Morocco. In Morocco, there is two people sitting across from each other, and they're yeah. making a, bo- they're bartering, they're making some kind of deal. I got you. And this box is given. Okay. And fast forward to this couple, which we end up finding out, this man uh-huh. and his wife. Okay. They're moving into this house, mm-hmm. and it's old and yeah. dingy. Yeah. And this, the 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 husband and wife, they have a very, you know, the wife is portrayed as being very cold, and right. there's something going on, right? The 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 dad, he just it's a strange character, you know. It's hard to explain, yeah. but he seems like just an overall nice guy, I guess. Larry and his Larry. wife Julia. Larry and Julia. Larry has a daughter who is Julia's stepdaughter. Yes. Okay, he's and um, the daughter doesn't like Julia. Her name's Christy. Christy, yes, yeah. good-looking brunette in the movie. Yeah. She comes home to visit the mm-hmm. dad. Mm-hmm. And doesn't doesn't want to be there. Doesn't want to be there, so she's staying somewhere else, uh-huh. right? But at some point, you find out that Larry's brother, uh-huh. uh, Frank, Frank, yes, Frank was the one who came into possession of the box. Of the box, I see. And Frank is supposed to be the wayward, uh, perverted brother, uh-huh. and. Somehow, Larry cuts his hand, moving a mattress upstairs, and the blood drips down through the floor and awakens the, the box. I think. Yes, that's exactly what happens. Because, but I'm trying to remember how was the box there? What's his name was staying there? He was there at one point. Yeah, Frank. The Frank had been Frank, there. Yeah, he solves the puzzle and hooked chains emerge to tear him apart at the very beginning, apparently. So he he solves the little puzzle. He's in his attic later on. I guess after the Morocco uh, thing. Yeah. Whatever. So he was there, perhaps. And the box kills him in his house. I'm guessing. He's, he's able to. He he gets. He's completely deformed and he's all jacked up. And so, after Larry cuts himself, the blood falls onto the floor mm-hmm. and causes some kind of supernatural. Yeah. You know. It, uh, domino effect where he awakens and so he's all uh, mummified yes and what he needs is m- people's blood he needs to 
suck or drain. I don't know what he does to people. And every time he does this, he's able he, his form becomes more improves, and, yeah. Im- improves, yes. improves. And so you you learn that Frank in the past had seduced Julia. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. And Julia's kind of enamored with uh, this guy too, yes. in some way. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So she recalls this. So when he and she's just I don't know she she's very cold to her, to Larry the husband the mm. whole time and then Chrissy doesn't like her right mm. so you like to believe she's just not a nice person yeah and when she comes across Frank in his um, shriveled up yeah, yeah in his gory condition yeah he's able to explain to her what's going on and he he seeks her help ah and this is when Julia starts lure, luring other men. So he can drain them. So he can drain I them. I see. And they do that over and over again. He gets more and more. She begins picking up men in bars and bringing them back to the house. Mm-hmm. And in this movie, I, bu- I think the only, I think the only nudity is Julia, uh-huh. a little partial nudity in uh, a sex scene with Frank early on. In the movie, you know, when, ah. when they're de- establishing her yes. connection with okay. Frank. Later on, um, mm. there re- really isn't any, and which is a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so they, they're moving along. She's bringing more and more of these people here or, or to get him going. And every time within the movie, there there's their... Um, the lo- the dialogue between the two is always about well we're gonna do this we're gonna run away we're gonna yes. whatever right? right so this is where Julia is I guess being enchanted you know, mm-hmm. she's that's her thoughts of the matter sure and at one point Frank just wants to kill Larry to <laughs> be done with it because he only needs one more anyways uh-huh. but Julia can't stand for it you yeah know, she gets cold feet right right and Chrissy. She comes in to save the day, kind of. She's always coming in at the right moment to like prevent something, uh-huh. right? But she, she, it ends up that Frank does take her dad, kills her dad, but he's able to turn into the dad. So he looks mm-hmm. like her dad. Mm-hmm. He looks like her dad, but it's not actually her. And Chrissy figures it out and. You know, attacks him, mm-hmm. but doesn't kill him. And oh, what's going on is she, they, she, they find the box. Uh, yes, she's in possession of the box. Right, and they're coming to her. She she makes the mistake of opening it, so now she's part of it. I see. And one of the deals was that Frank was do, was able to escape them. Nobody mm-hmm. ever, you know, gets away from these, cin- what are they called, cinnabites? Cinnabites. Cinnabites. Yeah. You know, they, they, they torture these people, whatever, they, they're they able to come across. But yeah. Frank had gotten away. So when Chrissy opens it, and she's being attacked by the cinnabites, mm-hmm. she makes a, a bargain with them, because they're fixing the you know torture her mm-hmm. they don't know the difference between pleasure and right. torture. So in the movie they show these hooks and you know this this ghastly type of torture that yeah. you can imagine uh she tells them that frank she knows where frank's is so they 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 let her go uh. she gets away and that's when she runs to the other house and i'm trying to remember how they kill how does frank die oh when they get there i think they open the box again and the cinnabites come out and they stop they able to stop frank uh-huh. and they show this gruesome scene where they put chain they pull chains on him they, and yeah they, him the cinnabites agree to take frank back in exchange they say that they will consider giving christy her freedom however the catch is that frank has to confess to escaping to them mm. Because yeah, they don't know if it's Frank again. In this yeah. situation, at this point, it's Larry. Yeah. So they kind of don't believe her. But during this process of just like in the quintessential villain starts telling you everything he's but gonna do or did before mm-hmm. it's too late or, or before he's finished, and then at the end, uh, they get stopped. So it's one of those moments where he's like, "And I got away from so and so, and they don't know." Her. And <sighs> sure enough, then they show up. Uh-huh. And. 
there's a love interest, right? So at one point in the movie, there's like a dinner party going on. Uh-huh. Larry and his friends, they show up. And at, one, at this point, I don't know if it's one of the friend's sons or whatever also, but Chrissy and this guy are love items. And they get together. Uh-huh. And she, he takes her home. and They're hanging. He's looking after her when she was in the hospital. Uh-huh. Because when she finds the box, she goes crazy. And the next thing you find, you, you realize she's in a hospital. And this is when she first opens it. When she opens it, it leads up to like this passageway that she walks down. And as she goes down it, this ugly mutant monster starts running after her. And she's barely able to escape. Well, that mutant monster makes a re- another... It re- reoccurs at the end of the movie. Ah. At, and that she has to kill... They, I, for, I don't even know how they kill this one, but her and that dude get away. Uh-huh. And at the end, there was this scene where there's like a, uh, a homeless person who I think Chrissy works at a pet store. And he goes in there and he grabs the flies, I guess, that they sell to feed <laughs> reptiles and mm-hmm. stuff. And he eats them. <clears throat> it's very weird. That guy makes an entrance at the very end of the movie. And he walks into a fire or something. We're going to have to look at this on, on Wikipedia on how it ends because it's a very weird, like, way to end. Yeah. And at the very, very, very end, they show the same scene but two different people now who are bartering over uh, the box. Yeah. And then it ends. Ah. Uh, and that, that was, just, that was. Yeah. You know, mm. I can see how this, this kind of formula of movie uh-huh. and branding of hellraiser the yep. pin f- whatever because you know he doesn't even talk the pin head makes only a couple of well he has a couple of scenes yeah within the entire movie huh. it's not like he's jason or or freddy cougar right, right? he's in the movie yeah. a whole lot there's, there's a bunch he's of not. these cinebite people though right or I mean, there's like different three characters there's like four there's one called the chatterer and one called the, butterball yes yeah, so butterball is so the chatterer is this one that's an alien. I, it doesn't. Even, I don't even know if it has eyes. It just has this ugly face mm-hmm. that's always doing this. <laughs> they call him the chatterer. Yeah, it's always doing this. Is it shows the gums like yeah, this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's just yeah. pretty gruesome. Uh-huh. Then there's the female who has this very. It's very. What's the word? Mach- machio sadistic kind Sado, of sadomasochism. Sa- sadomasochism yeah. Where there there's like these things through uh, hoops and coming yeah. out. You know, very yeah. okay. And because that's their whole thing is that they don't distinguish between pleasure and pain, and that's the whole thing. Yes, yes. So those are the mm. Cenobites. Gotcha. And they they have something to do with this box. Yeah. And so this whole thing works. I haven't seen the part two. Or part yeah. There's several sequels. Yeah. So I'm wondering where they're gonna go. Right. How from they go the, where do they go from this? This the same you know kind <clears> of the same plot where they open <clears> it and something different. Yeah. Or and so, like we mentioned earlier, too, this was Clive Barker's, like, directorial debut. What else has Clive Barker done that's... Um, I can look it up in two seconds, but I just wanted to throw this out there. So, Clive Barker, this is, like, first big, movie. big break, right? Okay. So, he, uh, he went to show his mom the film. Yeah. Right? It's like, here's my, here's my movie, Mom. Yeah. Check it out. And uh, I said that she cried tears of joy oh. upon seeing her son's name in the opening credits. But he leaned over to her and he said, he whispered... That this would be the happiest that she would be for the next two hours. <laughs> <laughs> she probably is like, son, what is what this? Is, What's what wrong you, with you? What, what are you doing? What, you know, a couple of things I want to hi- highlight about this movie and uh-huh. the special effects that we saw in other, uh, other movies. Uh-huh. This was done in what, 89? This was 87. 87. A budget of $1 million. Well, there's this part. There's a couple scenes where they're using the live. What, what is it with the clay animation kind of? Oh yeah. Those disintegrations. So they stop motion. Stop motion. Right, yeah. yeah, where they they they're using that several times when they're showing the body. Uh-huh. Metamorphic, you know, changing, uh, melting away, because I'm trying to think who. There's several. There's a scene in which they're. They display this where the a carcass, you know, bodies, a human form is uh-huh. like melting away, and it's showing all the guts and everything going through, and it's in this 
um, technology that they were using back then, uh-huh. which is re- which is remarkable. It's hard to explain when you watch m- movies in 2020. Uh-huh. But if you watch this movie, folks at home, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's hard to explain now because it's a vis- it's a cue, it's a visual cue you don't see anymore. Yeah. You know, right? But it does happen in this movie. Yeah, and I'm sure if I watch some more of these sure. '80s horrors, right. I'm going to see this technique yeah. used over and over again. And it, and like I said, it did have a budget of a million, mm-hmm. and it made close to 15. So wow. it, it was big, a box office success. Anyway, big box office. And so um, I was a little confused when I looked at uh, Clive Barker's filmography, right? Because I had read that this was his di- directorial debut, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, he he's actually been a writer in in lots of different movies mm-hmm. um and the two before hellraiser he was a writer one called underworld one called raw head rex okay but his de- directorial debut was hellraiser but he's done hellbound um which is another one, night breed hellraiser 2 Candyman. Candyman man yeah. is a big lord one. of illusions um midnight meat train Ooh. book of blood um so yeah um, Candyman, you know, when, you, Candyman, when, you, when you're in the movies, Candyman. when you're in the movies, you can make a bunch of movies, don't make any money, don't make any money, but then when you make that one, yeah. that makes a fortune, yeah. then you're good. So here he made this, you know, maybe this one isn't the best. The mm-hmm. Hellraiser was probably one that made them a lot because they made sequels. Yeah. And then Candyman. So, you know, you're really looking for the franchise. Yeah. You know, you make sure. one and then you can make a bunch. And see, yeah, Candyman, he was the producer and the writer, but he didn't direct it. He didn't direct it. Yeah. I can see. I can see yeah. that, I guess. So, um, but talking, you said, you know, kind of cult classic, big cult following, I would say, whatever. Uh-huh. Um, it. Could you see why? Well, like, is this like the, because, um, you know, I can see maybe people who like to hang from hooks and stuff. I I can see (laughs) where there was some intrigue to the Cenobite characters, because again, in the movie, they're seldom used, Uh you know, they're brought in, and screen time Mm -hmm. is very minimal. Right. So I could see how in the sequel, if I'm the pro- you know producer, you right. know in the creative team, I'm thinking, yeah. guys, this in the in the sequel, let's focus more on right. Pinhead, maybe his origins or this and that. Yeah. And I, maybe that's what they did. I don't know because I yeah. never I haven't seen the sequel. Sure. Maybe that's how, it, how how that goes, and maybe part of the cult following is part of the sequels as well, since they made several. You know, three. Two, did they make three? I think um, they made three. Let's see, Hellraiser. And I think they've also done a reboot. Yeah, I think so too. Um, they've done probably a bunch. I, I can't see right now. I can't find, I'm bad at looking this stuff up right now. But yeah, I do know that they, you know there were multiple sequels. Um, Hellraiser, Hellraiser Two, Hellraiser Three, Hellraiser Judgment, Hellraiser Bloodline, Hellraiser Revelations, Hellraiser Inferno. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So they made so, a bunch. Yeah, okay. They so, did. and so, did, so you're asking. And they this all, is, yeah, this they was the first one. So sure. how how was it? I think there was just enough intrigue into those Cenobite, especially Pinhead oh. character, to where you can make another one. Sure. Going any way you wanted. Yeah. And, and this and is those gonna, people who really liked it were like, yes, I want more of this guy. Of this guy. Yeah. And that that would have been a great strategy of the writers going on moving forward. If they're trying to make a series of a movie, like, sure. oh, this leads perfectly into a sequel. Yeah. Um, you know, Chrissy in the movie is an actually good. You, let's get into some of the characters, the, sure. the, the actors. Chrissy is an attractive woman, uh, young woman at the time. I uh-huh. mean, this was in '85. She's probably 25 yeah. or younger in this movie because she's supposed to be like a college student, right? Yeah, Chrissy so she, Cotton, her, played by Ashley Lawrence. Ashley Lawrence. Yep. She does a great, yeah, pretty girl, pretty job. You know, does a great job in the movie, yep. and makes it watchable. Sure, the acting is pretty good. Yeah, but again, when you you know, we talk about cult classics, cult classic always means movies that are old that like are fine wine. They weren't like, like hits the first time around. Kind of that people go back and revisit, and okay. yeah, nostalgia again plays into yeah. a bunch of that. So right? this movie, in that way, you know why? Because there's a lot of this. This movie doesn't isn't dated. Uh-huh. Like, have you ever? There's a movie with Sandra Bullock called. Um, the uh, what's it called the network or yeah. the um, this, maybe it's the network something like that right and it's from like 1995 right it's supposed to be like a 
IT thriller. Right. Yes. And if you watch it in 2020, it is ridiculous because yeah. they're talking about like dial up modems and downloading things, floppy disks. Right. You know, yeah, it, know. it's yeah. just so, super yeah, dated. Yeah. Sure. Super dated. Right. But when you watch this movie, yeah. there's really no reference to cell phones, to this, yeah. to that. It's, to the time it's, period. To the time period. It's almost like this could have been done other than incorporating the use of technology, cell phones in the movie. Yeah. But, you know, they're just using a phone. Yeah. The thing is, it, it it ages a little better. Yeah. It absolutely. does. It does. And, that and then uh, Christy's character, too, she comes back in pretty much every one of the sequels. So she's oh. Christy Cotton uh, in... The, all the sequels straight up until 2002. And is, this, oh. is it the same actress? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Let's see. Because that could have been a pretty sweet gig for her. Yeah, no kidding. Um, 2002, Christy, Ashley Lawrence, yeah. Same actress, same thing. So, I just keep so, she, did, she, so she did all the movies? All the way up until 2002. Wow. <laughs> Can you imagine if you're an actor... And you, you do this one movie, right? Right. And it ends up being like your career. Like later on, people are like, well, what did you... Oh, I was an actress. Oh, yeah. what were you in? Yeah. Uh, this movie called Hellraiser. Yeah, and oh. every sequel after that. Just look at her filmography. I want to see what else did she do besides right. Hellraiser. All right, let's see. Uh, th- well, I did. So I can tell you, they are all pretty much horror films. I mean, she's uh, cast into a horror... So She pigeonholed herself. Her, and, and, and Hellraiser was her first... Her acting debut in the '88, where there was Hell Hellbound, Hellraiser two. So it was just a year later. They put these out pretty quick. quick um, yeah. Face the Edge, Mikey, Hellraiser three in 1992, The Lurking Fear in 1994, Stranger by the Night, uh, Livers Ain't Cheap in 1996. <laughs> whatever so that is. It sounds like she always plays some kind of either yeah. damsel in distress, some sure. strong woman, some Probably. ripley. You know, like in this movie, she's a very yeah. Um, what's the word? You know, she's one of the the, the protagonists where she's fighting back. Yeah. She's part of you know. She's not the a strong oh, character. I'm, I'm Ex- naked and you're gonna be killed. Exactly. Yeah, okay. she's, she's a, a problem a, solver. A strong female character. A strong yes. female yeah. character. Yes. Fe- this is a, a, a this could be on a feminist list of movies to watch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Probably. Because um, you know why? Because the other woman, Julia, is a is a slut. Poor, right? Yeah, who, who, who's sleeping with her husband's them. brother? Right. But you know what? That that's also very uh, empowering for women. So if you're a feminist, you can be a slut because <laughs> that's part of God. being. Oh my goodness! No, I think it. I mean, yeah. I'm not. These are just words that can be offensive, but at the same time, they have like that slut walk. Like they embrace this, gotcha. Seth. They're gotcha. embracing it. So that's why I'm just I'm bringing it up. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm looking at some uh, trivia pieces for this too. Let's see. Took six six hours to apply the prosthetic Cenobite makeup on Doug Brady. Wow, six hours for the pinhead guy? That's crazy. That's like a whole day, and then it's, you got to act in it. It's pretty, what? pretty. It was pretty intense. That uh, I've yeah. heard about that. And some of these other ones, like when um, remember Jackass for Johnny Knoxville, yeah. where they would get all those oh, yeah. for the grandpa. It's yeah. old. It, apparently, that took. Would take forever, also. Yeah. So they haven't found a way to speed that up. Yeah. Uh, the budget of this movie was one million. It earned about twenty million. It was the directing debut of Clyde Barker, who had made only short films before this. Um. But one of these things, though, Doug Brady. I guess he was. Um, I don't know which character he made. But anyways, one of the <laughs> trivia things is this guy Doug Brady, mm-hmm. who. Uh, what which character was he? Hang on one second. Let's Doug Brady was he Larry or was he Frank? I'm gonna see real quick. Doug Brady. Doug Brady was mm. Doug Brady was the lead Cenobite, so he was Pinhead. Oh, Pinhead! But yeah. they went to this production party afterwards, or whatever, and uh, people started asking him why he was there. They didn't recognize him, and he oh. got all angry and uh, started some fights or something, and then left the party because they were all like, who, "Who's <laughs> this guy?" Just, uh, and he's like, "I'm the main bad guy." That's What's going really. on. So the voice, you know, um, the voice of Pinhead is very unique. Um, it's, and I'm going to just do a terrible job of trying to explain it on a podcast. Yeah. But did you hear about? The Mandalorian. Apparently, the actor who played the Mandalorian mm-hmm. had the same kind of issue. So they got Pascal, rid of Pablo Pascal. Pablo uh, Pascal, Pedro, something like that. Pedro so he quit. Apparently, he. The rumor is this is his last season, and it was because he had wanted to have <coughs> scenes in which 
you could see his face. Apparently, right. I don't watch the movie. I don't watch the show. Well, that's the whole thing it. about uh, this character. It yeah. is um, that's their creed. No one ever takes your helmet. Your armor is like your life. Yeah. And if you take your helmet off, you can never put it back on. Uh, right. So no one that's alive can ever see you in it. And, and so I mean, you had to kind of know that going into it. Sure. Well, he, no, no. I, well, his, his sure he read the script. His something. agents are working hard to try to work into yeah. the creative team to be like, listen, we gotta find a way so that he can actually break the code and yeah, see his face I somehow. I get that. You know, and apparently this was starting to become a problem for him. Uh-huh. Like he needed people to know that he's in this super successful show because they don't get to see his face how's he going to capitalize on this later on and so i read this it was on on the internet so it's got to be true so folks at home two movie reviews we did life source and hellraiser hellraiser and we're gonna cap it off if seth will have me we can do one more let's go we're going to do one more, folks, but you got to stick with us to see which one it is. Don't forget the podcast is brought to you by Sage Choice Insurance Agency. You can call us at 361-400-2411. Referral sources. We're always looking for them. Realtors, loan originators, call us. We want to help you close your deals. 361-400-2411. Like us on Facebook. This In the search, Jamin's Daily. In the search. Sage Choice Insurance. You can find us. Like us. Share it. Stick with us, folks. Jamin's Daily, the best is yet to come.